Welcome everyone to our second Climate Friday event of the fall semester. My name is Todd Lavasser and I am a member of the Center for Sustainable Development that is hosting this. I'm also a faculty member affiliated with Religious Studies, Environmental and Sustainability Studies, and Women and Gender Studies. The event format for today is about 30 minutes of presentation and then we will be invited to enter into breakout rooms for vibrant discussion. The event is sponsored by the Center for Sustainable Development, which provides students with the opportunities and resources to engage in our community sustainably. At the center and at the college, we define sustainability as the integration of five pillars that make up sustainability. These pillars are social, economic, environmental, political, and personal. Addressing issues with the five pillars equips students with sustainability literacy, giving one the skills and knowledge to tackle 21st century problems. Within the five pillars is the specific triple bottom line of sustainability, where these three economic, and you may also hear equity, environmental and social systems meet and intersect. These systems are necessary in the construction of individual, institutional, community, regional, and planetary resilience. Along with the triple bottom line, the integration of personal and political systems encourage students to approach sustainability from multiple perspectives. This could be encouraging fellow students and peers to make small adjustments to their daily lives to include more sustainable behaviors and enhancing sustainability literacy by taking sustainability courses that are taught by faculty across the curricula. With the skills sustainability literacy gives us, we can apply our knowledge to create a more resilient, equitable future for all. Today's Climate Friday event, focusing on abolitionist and eco-futurist perspectives to end environmental racism within the context of rapid climate change, highlights the critically important nature of using social, economic, political, personal, and environmental systems to understand and ultimately solve 21st century problems, especially related to issues of climate justice. Through this event, you will hear various themes that impact the five pillars in some way to help equip you to solve 21st century problems. Or you may hear about personal actions you can take in your life to do the same. This event relates to CFC's 2020 2021 sustained solves theme of global warming and climate change. We know that global warming will disproportionately impact some populations compared to others in some geographic regions harder than others. This is why climate justice is central to understanding global warming. Given Charleston's location and future models, we are in a very climate vulnerable community and must work together to adapt to global warming. It is hoped that by viewing this issue through the triple bottom line and the center's five pillars, you will be able to advocate for adaptive solutions to climate change. I'm now going to introduce the two speakers and hosts of today's meeting. Uh, these are two of my heroines on campus. They're amazing. If you have not yet taken a class with either of these uh, colleagues of mine, I strongly encourage you to do so. The first is Dr. Hollis France, who's born in Guyana in South America. She is the acting chair of the Department of Political Science at the College of Charleston. Dr. France's ongoing research focuses on diverse and social economies as alternative development models, the intersections of gender and political economy, indigenous epistemologies in the Anglophone Caribbean, and indigenous political mobilization and development discourses. In the wider Charleston community, she is a member of the Worker-Owned Transformative Teaching Collective, which centers social justice praxis, and is a current board member of the South Carolina affiliate American Civil Liberties Union. Dr. Christy Cage Bryan is on the faculty at the College of Charleston, teaching primarily in women's and gender studies, as well as environmental and sustainability studies and anthropology and sociology. Dr. Bryan is the interim director of the Gender and Sexuality Equity Center. As a cultural anthropologist by training, Dr. Bryan's earlier area of research explored transnational adoption, and particularly the ways in which the adoption industry exposes racialized imbalances of power between adopting and sending nations. Dr. Bryan's teaching is heavily informed by social movements of queer liberation and for the abolition of the prison industrial complex. Cage is a founding member of the Transformative Teaching Collective. Hi everybody, this is Cage. We're so happy to be with you today. Thanks so much for tuning in. So we wanted to just start by acknowledging that all that we do here in Charleston and across the Americas happens on stolen land. Here in this region of the Low Country, we exist on land that belongs to the Kuso, Kiowa, Etowan, Edisto, Stono, Wando people. 
For those of us with European ancestry, it's our responsibility to contend with what it means to embody identities as settlers in the ongoing structure of settler colonialism. And we also exist just miles away from the point where 40 to 60% of all enslaved Africans arrived after the brutal Middle Passage. In this low country of South Carolina, generations of Gullah people have resisted enslavement, confinement, assimilation, violence, and domination to breathe life into the ever-evolving Gola culture that thrives today. So it is with an acknowledgement of gratitude and deep respect for indigenous Gola and African people's ongoing relationship with the land that we have this conversation today about disrupting and dismantling the systems of settler colonialism and white supremacy. Hollis and I are here, as Todd said, as members of the Transformative Teaching Collective. The collective is a worker-owned cooperative organized to co-create spaces of liberatory education and resilience. We're horizontally organized as a way to ensure that we all have equal power in making decisions about the creation, delivery, and assessment of our work. We resist capitalist, rapid growth, hierarchical models of labor, and we strive to stay present to the harms, wounds, and trauma of the exploitative systems we have inherited and reproduced in order to build relationships built on healing justice and transformative justice. We endeavor to understand conflict as generative in teaching us how to envision new justice paradigms. So just to give a little overview of what we're hoping to do in this hour today, we'll explore the differences between mainstream environmentalism and the movements for environmental justice. We'll offer some brief examples of environmental racism that we hope will illustrate how the wicked problems of climate change today clearly have their foundations in transnational systems of settler colonialism and plantation economy slavocracies. We will invite you to have conversation in small groups to explore relationality and to ask yourselves what aspects of our current society need to be eliminated and what types of relationships need to be built to transform our human egocentric society into a multi-species interdependent perhaps even what Kim Tallbear and Angela Wiley call an eco-erotic future. We'll then conclude by inviting each group to share eco-futurist dreams based on their desires for new paradigms, relationships, and practices. Okay, so I guess it's over to me. I'm Hollis Franz. Um, thank you everybody for being here. So let me begin by acknowledging the contributions of the first Climate Friday's um, presenters, Professor Deb Bidwell and Jen Wright, uh, for sharing with us the science behind the climate crisis and the consequences of ignoring the crisis if there is not an urgent thrust to deal with the crisis. I'm always reminded by my co-presenter, Cage, that while there is an urgency to dismantle and destroy these harmful systems of climate atrocities, equally we must be mindful and intentional about thinking about how do we repair a distressed planet. Therefore, it is within that stream of thought that we will be asking you to imagine alternative eco-futures. To do that, I will start by exploring the current knowledge terrain around present environmental, the, uh, the um, current terrain around the present environmental movement thinking. I want to juxtapose the mainstream environmentalist movement against what many call the new environmentalism, um, popularly known or referred to as the environmental justice movement. So the mainstream environmental movement in the United States drew its inspiration from the civil rights movement spawned by African Americans who were standing up and speaking out against inequality and injustice in every walk of life. However, it appears that while the mainstream environmental movement were inspired by folks speaking truth to power, the mostly white middle class who took the helm of the environmental movement neglected to forge connections and relationships with communities of color. So what we have witnessed over the last five decades is yes, the environmental organizations 
have become better funded, stronger, and won many battles. But yet, the climate crisis coming down on us like an avalanche disproportionately affects Black and brown people, the poor, and globally, we're losing agricultural soil, biodiversity, fishing, and forests. Armed with this shortcoming of the mainstream environmentalism, the environmental justice movement recognized that there was a need to build a bridge between environmentalism and in communities of color. They acknowledged that ecological degradation is intimately tied to failing political systems of eroding democracy, racial in inequities, economic insecurity, and imperatives of economic growth. They also pointed to the limitations of traditional advocacy by both the civil rights movement and mainstream environmentalists. And hence, they called for a rediscovery and revitalization of the radical abolitionist legacy. Coupled with this, they asked to review the legacy of radical of the radical cr critique that capitalism is incompatible with ecological imperatives of liberation of the whole natural world. And awareness is positive that to, the distri to distress the planet through large scale ravishing of the earth's above and subsurface layers, its oceans and seas coupled with the F effects of wind and atmospheric currents becomes a harbinger of the planet's debt and decay. So now I'll turn it over to Cage to unpack for us this idea of environmental racism. Thanks, Hollis. Yeah, so what is environmental racism and how does that connect with what we're calling today ecofuturism? Robert Bullard, who many think of as one of the founders of environmental justice paradigms, explains that environmental racism exists when we see a disproportionate impact of environmental hazards on people of color. These hazards can be from the placement of pipelines for industrial oil extraction, from polluting factories, toxic waste dumps, or a result, as a result of poor municipal planning and neglect, as in the well-known case of the Flint, Michigan water contamination crisis. Dr. Bullard emphasizes that whether intended or not, if policies, procedures, or directives disadvantage communities of color, it's environmental racism. And we know that the consequences of environmental racism are severe. Communities of color actually targeted as sites for polluting facilities, waste sites and the like, have higher rates of cancer, asthma, miscarriages, low birth weight babies, just to name a few of the adverse health conditions linked to pollution. So in a minute, we'll offer some examples of environmental racism. But as we mention these examples, we urge you to consider what it would take to eliminate, to abolish, prevent the commonplace reproduction of environmental racism. In their article, A Radical Alliance Between the Black and Green Could Save the World, Gus Speth and Philip Thompson argue that while mainstream environmentalists of the 1960s and 70s may have been inspired by the legal gains of the civil rights movement, they did not dig deep enough to align with the most radical roots of the civil rights movement, the abolitionists, the freedom fighters that existed um, from the beginning of slavery and before. And had they done that, they may have better been able to build the necessary relationships with communities of color. Speth and Thompson conclude their analysis with the 1977 Iroquois Elders Basic Call to Consciousness, which states, the technologies and social systems which have destroyed the animal and plant life are also destroying the native people. And the people who are living on this planet need to break with the narrow concept of human liberation and begin to see liberation as something which needs to be extended to the whole of the natural world. 
I hear the Iroquois call as part of the chorus of indigenous futurist thinkers and Afrofuturist thinkers writing today who invite us to imagine possibilities for reworlding that revive and the resistant strategies of land defenders, water protectors, leaders of the Underground Railroad, possibilities that require us to time travel as Gula Afrofuturist Sarah Days does so beautifully, illustrating how her presence in the South serves as a portal, allowing her to build and deepen her relationship with her ancestors. Possibilities that require us to create what indigenous Cree futurist Karen Recolette calls technologies of care and decolonial landings that allow for kinship building through ancestral and even celestial ways of knowing. What I learned from these indigenous and Afrofuturists is that to re-world, we must remain present to how the past is alive within us. And without that, we'll never be able to fully imagine what we are truly capable of in creating um, a world that is passed down through the desires of, of those who wanted to begin again, to make anew, and to reinvent ourselves and our world. As I place the writing of Sarah Days and Karen Recolette side by side here within my own words next to Hollis's words, I think about my relationality to these women with whom I share this planet and how our landings on Turtle Island are so distinct. My landing here is tied to my settler ancestors, making my duty to dismantle and reworld and prevent future colonizing harms different from theirs. For me, the work of genuinely, radically collaborating with, rather than appropriating, the work of indigenous and Afrofuturist thinkers who I admire is the work of unlearning the conditioning of the settler oppressor that lives within me. And I want to thank Carolyn Recolette, who I've only recently been introduced to through Hollis's friends at the University of Toronto for helping me articulate that. And as we turn to briefly examine some examples of environmental racism, we can think about how each is tied to the settler colonialism and the plantation economy that believed supreme human domination over nature and other humans was somehow an enviable goal. I'm reminded of Chris Carrico's recent paper, Quarantine Meditations. Chris states, quote, Ebola, bird flu, swine flu, SARS, H1N1, Zika, AIDS, and coronavirus all came out of large-scale capitalist farms or capitalist markets in wild meats sold to people with no contact with these animals before. What we thought was domination of nature turned out to be dialectical, end quote. So as we look at these egregious attempts to dominate nature, let's strive to imagine what existed before nature, including humans, had to fight back so viciously against the human-created catastrophes of colonialism, militarism, and capitalism. And with that, I'll turn it over to Hollis to uh, bring us into a few examples. So the examples I want to share with you highlight the transnational connections of environmental racism. The first is centered on the Wapachan indigenous nation in the South Rupununi of Guyana in South America, the country in which I was born and I do my research. To a certain extent, this is the classic narrative of governments prioritizing the concerns of capital, in this case, foreign and local mining interests over the interests of indigenous peoples. This story could be applied to the experiences of many indigenous peoples worldwide, where governments pri prioritize profit over people and the environment in order to boast about economic growth. In the case of the Wapachan, the government's persistent practice of granting mining concessions to Wapachan ancestral land, specifically the Marudi Mountain, without free and prior informed consent, is numerous externalities for the Wapachan people. From the loss of topsoil due to heavy deforestation, wildlife populations disappearing, to the loss of hunting grounds. This further extends to the pollution of waterways and depletion of marine life. If you take just these factors all together, you quickly recognize the growing loss of food sovereignty 
This in turn creates a vicious cycle whereby the Wapachan are gradually losing access to their ancestral diets, which lends to increasing cases of diabetes as the Wapachan become more and more dependent on processed store um, bought, often imported foods in communities that are primarily subsistence based and lack steady streams of cash from wage labor. With funding from international groups sympathetic to the historical discrimination of land dispossession and the disproportional environmental hazards faced by indigenous communities, the Wapachan are fighting back. They're utilizing GPS technologies to collect evidence-based documentation of the assault to their land, territory, culture, and identity. So briefly, I wanna share with you a second example, which I won't go into much detail. Given the time constraints again, this futures the, the transnational um, connections of environmental racism. And Cage, if you can go to the next slide. I don't know where Cage is, sorry. Sorry, the next slide is, yeah. is not yours. <laughs> oh, it's not mine, sorry. <laughs> In recent years in the Caribbean island of Martinique, still considered a territory of France, anti-colonial and pro-environmentalist protests have broken out. Protests have taken to the, the protesters have taken to the streets to demand reparations and justice for what they call genocide by poisoning by the landed elite through the use of the pesticide chlorodicone, which is similar to DDT. And this, is used to, uh, this was used to spray bananas when the export of bananas to France became a major part of Martinican agriculture in the 1930s. Tests have shown that 92% of the population who are descendants of enslaved Africans tested positively for chlorodicone in the body and 19% of children tested exceeded the toxic dose. A French research cent center estimates that it will take 200 to 500 years for the chemical to dissipate. There is no known decontamination method. President, um, French President Macron has called this an environmental scandal. These two transnational examples highlight how the results of capitalism and colonialism actively continue to contribute to the climate crisis and carries with it a pain that comes with a long history of racial terror. Cage, you could go ahead with yours. Thanks, Hollis. So in selecting examples um, of environmental racism, for the purpose of today, I came to see environmental racism as a direct form of home invasion. So my first example takes us back to 1946, the beginning of the Cold War. Between 1946 and 1958, the United States detonated 67 nuclear bombs on a string of islands in the Central Pacific. The bombs were detonated in the sky, under the water, and on the land, the home of the people of the Marshall Islands and many other forms of life. The US also tested biological warfare there, including experiments with bacteria designed to kill the quote enemy troops. And they even transported 130 tons of contaminated soil from the Nevada atomic testing site to dump on the home of the Marshall Island people. To make way for the warfare experiments, the US military deceived the people of the Marshall Islands relocated them to nearby islands, causing horrible disruptions to their culture and leaving them to deal with acute radiation poisoning, thyroid disease, miscarriages, and other diseases, now exacerbated by the intensity of sea level rise and climate change. As a lasting reminder of the environmental catastrophe, the U.S. built an enormous concrete dome, known as the tomb, which holds more than 3.1 million cubic feet of radioactive soil and debris, including lethal amounts of plutonium. The dome is now cracked and leaking radioactive waste into the water, killing marine life. 
Nurji Joseph was a child on the islands during the testing. When she lamented the fact that her grandchildren would never get to experience the islands as she had, she said, we had a oneness when we lived on Rongelap. We worked together, we ate together, we played together. That has been lost. Ms. Joseph's words reminded me of those uttered by LaDonna Brave Bull Allard, the co-founder of Sacred Stone Resistance Camp at Standing Rock. Like Ms. Joseph, she recalled the home invasion of her land when the US Army Corps of Engineers in the 50s and 60s flooded their most fertile bottomlands to build a dam without the consent of the Standing Rock Sioux. Seeing the connections between that period and the more recent invasion due to the Dakota Access Pipeline, LaDonna Brave Bull Allard asks, what did we ever do to deserve this? I imagine Ms. Joseph asking the same question. My next example of environmental racism as home invasion takes us to Philadelphia, May 13th, 1985. That's the day the city of Philadelphia dropped a bomb on its own people. The city and some residents of West Philadelphia were offended by the back to nature and revolutionary black liberation group known as MOVE. MOVE had been regularly intimidated, harassed, and threatened by the Philadelphia police, and nine of their members who came to be known as the MOVE Nine were sent to prison. So when city officials lost patience and gave up on the hard, peaceful work of conflict transformation, they made the violent and hasty decision to begin their final assault on MOVE. The night before they evacuated MOVE neighbors, then on the day of the assault, Ramona Africa, the lone adult survivor of the bombing, remembers the police commissioner announcing on the bullhorn, attention MOVE, this is America. You have to abide by the laws and rules of the United States. The police demanded that MOVE members come out of their home, then began flooding the home with water cannons, sending 10,000 rounds of ammunition into their home, tear gas, and then the bomb, a demolition device typically used in combat, laced with C4 explosives. Then as the fire grew and spread, the city let the neighborhood burn. 11 MOVE members were killed in their home, including five children and the founder of the MOVE organization. 61 homes were destroyed and more than 250 citizens were left homeless. Ramona Africa and other observers recall that when MOVE members attempted to evacuate, they were forced back into their burning home because of police gunfire. Ramona Africa then served seven years in prison on rioting and conspiracy charges. While no city official, officials were ever criminally charged for the murders and destruction that occurred on that day, despite the fact that an investigation and city commission concluded that the assault was reckless, ill-conceived, and hastily approved. I mention this incident as environmental racism because in their determination to live communally, love animals and the environment and their African ancestry, differently than the mainstream dominant culture, their home and the homes of their neighbors were obliterated. The uprisings we are seeing today against police brutality are generations in the making. And with each life taken by police and militarized violence, an environmental justice perspective allows us to see the lives taken in a broader view. Before Freddie Gray suffered the aggression of the Baltimore police force that ended his life, he had endured what Rita Turner called the hidden violence of environmental racism. Turner builds on Rob Nixon's concept of slow violence to ask us to consider the imposed poverty, the food apartheid, the, leading, the, the lead poisoning in Freddie Gray's childhood home due to the deliberate negligence of property owners that shaped Freddie Gray's, Freddie Gray's life before he became one of the far too many names we say today in our outrage against state violence, state violence, home invasion of the bodies, the neighborhoods, and the land we call home. And we'd like to just thank all of these artists that we've included in our presentation today to hopefully spark your imaginations of what creativity can do as we imagine a new world. And I also just wanna give a personal shout out to the, the artists who did the portrait of uh, George Floyd as my um, friend and brother, Young Ray Tarselli, confined in a Pennsylvania prison. And he did that from his prison cell. So we're gonna invite you to go into dialogue now. Um, and our dialogue that we're inviting you to have has three components. So we want you to think about relationality. 
the idea that we are all related, connected in some way. And so in your small group, if you could strive to find a point of connection, a point of relationality that's beyond just attending the Zoom session at the College of Charleston, uh, something a little deeper that, that allows you to relate and connect. And then we want you to think of yourselves as abolitionists. And um, as Hollis and I have been going back and forth about what really comes up and what is conjured by the, the term abolition, we're not talking about the white abolitionists who, as soon as the Civil War was over, um, turned their backs on Black people and um, became opportunistic about their own capitalist gains. We're talking about abolitionists who are freedom fighters in it for the long haul. So what long protracted struggle um, could you imagine that you want to um, fight to end? What do you want to end? What do you want to get rid of? What do you want to abolish? And then the third component is thinking about an eco-future, the eco-futurist perspective. What new practices, paradigms, relationships will need to be built as you abolish this thing that you've determined needs to be eliminated? And so with this conversation, we invite you to keep in mind the triple bottom line, to think expansively about ecological, economic, and social conditions, um, to be utopian, to, um, to not hold back your desires for what you imagine a new world looking like. So we'll give you time to um, go into your groups, and um, you'll also find in the chat a Google Doc that can allow you to um, just take notes if you'd like to in your conversation. That's optional, you don't have to do that. Uh, but I believe it is in the chat, right? Um, okay, and, and so we'll give you 10 minutes or so. And um, on that Google Doc, you'll see that there's a little script just to make our report back a little smoother so that, um, you know, you can fill in the blanks with your own language, and then we'll try to hear from as many groups as possible so we can um, share these eco-futurist desires. So Darcy's gonna put everyone in a room. I think that's, that's most everybody back, right? Okay, cool. So uh, thanks everybody for turning your screens on so we can see your beautiful faces, and let's do some eco-future fantasizing and dreaming. Um, so anybody who wants to go first, just jump right in. Don't be shy. Yeah, don't be shy. I know it takes courage to be the first yeah. one. Be brave. We just want to know about your eco-futurist utopia. What would that look like? Hey, my group one colleagues, there were some amazing ideas to share. Let, let's do it. Well, I just loved what we left off on, which um, if you don't mind me sharing, Richella, I think, is that your name? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> she just made some really great comments about how important it is when moving forward with this um, abolitionist mindset that we have hope involved and um, that we do implement joy and um, mm -hmm. especially just the attitude of hope to increase our efficacy and ability to actually move forward. Thanks. And if I, if I might add about that whole idea of hope, right, that hope could be still kind of a very passive kinds of stance. You know, some people talk about having courage, you know, courage and then active, being active about it, right, being an activist that leads you towards also that hope, right? So that with hope, you've got to be doing something with it, right? It's not just like sitting back and say, I have hope. Yeah, 100%. Mm -hmm. And let me just give a plug real quick for Adrian Marie Brown, pleasure activism. So mm -hmm. Rochelle's point about having joy, right? We have to yeah. um, have pleasure in this work that we do. So check her out, it's a fun read. Related to that, there's um, there's a great organization called the Pachamama Alliance, and they have this game changer 
training that I'm that I've been working on and they have a whole section on um, grounded optimism and the, the way in which that's a political act and I think so one way of thinking about hope is that we have to stubbornly maintain optimism and it's not it's not the sort of you know it's not a disconnected optimism it's very much grounded in the realities of today, but it's stubbornly refusing to accept the status quo and always moving towards a more positive future. And I think that it's, it's very empowering and I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, the power of refusal, so important. All right, does anybody want to follow the script a little bit? And yeah, okay, Jay. I can go, yeah. Okay. we. Um... We talked for like ecofuturist ideas, um, kind of about ooh, that was loud. Uh, <laughs> la, uh, these kind of larger structures of uh, superiority and a big focus being kind of capitalism and this hierarchy and exploitation um, and greed and of something to to be abolished. The sense of uh, kind of superiority of like humans from everything else uh, and this separation from nature um, and kind of grounding it into what to do. Um, we talked a lot about kind of realizing participation in these structures, right, through actions and words and thoughts, um, and also building compassion and recognizing um, just like the inherent value in, you know, other humans and other living beings and the rest of this giant system that we're a part of. Thank you, Jay. Yeah, yeah. I've been thinking a lot about um, how to shift away from white monoculture so much as um, about not valuing the written word over relationships. So what you said about actions, words, thoughts, all of it, you know, not just sort of what has been written down by the so-called experts. Thanks, Jerry. Yeah. And also, you know, talking about um, dismantling in terms of hierarchies, you know, one of the things that I constantly try to reinforce is this whole idea of interdependence, right? Um, because I think in terms of how we've been taught um, in terms of Western society is this idea that somehow we're not in, the, we're, we're separate from, right? And we're better than. Uh, and so it, it, it if, if we, you know, those hierarchies and so forth really bound us, right? They, they kind of bound us and they imprison us. If we can think about these interdependence and go moving beyond these ideas of boundedness, I think also that might be pretty useful in what we need to be doing. Somebody else in terms of uh, the script? looking at what you folks came up with. Um, I can chime in for uh, group three and encourage my comrades to chime yeah. in too. Uh, <laughs> just but our uh, attention to start with relation to flooding simply in the Sorry, one of the voices glitched out on my computer. Did that happen for y'all too? Yes. Yeah, but you go ahead. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'll, uh, I was in group three and encouraged my yeah, friends to chime in, but our eco-futurist desires were grounded in a reimagining of our sense of self-value from one that comes from, um, that is derived from capitalism and kind of professional value and one that's more related to the value from interdependence to our natural systems. Um, and also kind of a solidarity with marginalized communities relationship to nature both um, now and in the past. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So. Yeah, Todd, were you saying you want to say something about relationality? Um, well, it's more to, you know, there's a bit of silence, but we just started with talking about, yeah, you know, relationality, the, the, um, the flooding of the last week that we've all been that related to all of us. Like, how do we navigate this? And like, that's the new normal as mm. Deb and Jen showed this last week, the Hollis you flagged uh, early in the talk is uh, like it's here now and, and, and like it's impacting all of us in ways. Um, so yeah, that was been literally I think we have having problems with Todd's yeah, you're cutting in and out a bit, Todd. 
But thank you, yeah, for the relationality of the, of the water and the flooding. Mm -hmm. Hi, TJ. <laughs> Do you want to say anything that came up in your group? I don't know which group you're in, but I'm just picking on TJ because she's in my class. Um, I was in group three. Um, based also, what we discussed was it really needs to start with education, especially elementary education. It needs to start from a young age. It's a lot harder to change these standards that have been put on to us by society at an older age instead of just teaching them from a young age i don't want to say the proper way but a better way of thinking absolutely there's so much to do with children and young people um something that my group said i was from group one and um this is kind of short but one of the practices that we would like to build would be to normalize activism between um, different races and genders and, you know, more diversity is basically the point of it. Great. Yeah. Yes. Multiracial movements, intergenerational movement, multigender movement. Absolutely. Thank you, Jared. Yeah. Yeah, because one of the things is, I, I'm, you know, um, kind of neglecting to kind of mention that that whole idea, you know, although the environmental justice movement, you know, kind of picks up and, and critiques the mainstream uh, movement, which was, again, didn't make those connections and forge connections with communities of color, but it's also going beyond just in terms of race, but also thinking about gender and, you know, and all the different um, or various identities. Um, also need to be included. I think it really, um, when there's more diversity, it kind of puts up like a unified front, you know? Like we, um, yeah, I'm gonna leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, and, and unity becomes more interesting, right, Jared? It, because it's not just this flat concept that we all think the same and so we have unity, but as we come from these drastically different positions and places and we can still find common ground and find that unity. So it's much more exciting. Yeah. I would like to add something as well. We didn't really talk about it, uh, but it's definitely kind of rooted in, in the superiority thing and, and also with the more diversity. Um, but a structure to think a lot about that I think we're just getting to is ableism um, and all these, and, it, and it's, and I think it's very much tied to productivity and capitalism, right? And, um, but yeah, I wanted to put that thought out there as well. Thank you. Yeah, and how we, we think about the body then, right? And if we think about the body as, you know, its own ecosystem and maybe that, you know, builds bridges with um, these movements against environmental racism and people of different abilities, people with disabilities have um, often have a, a clear sense of the way that bodies are valued and excluded differently. You know. And I'd like to comment, like not following the script, but just to comment on this talk so far and to go off um, Jared's comment on like the importance of diversity. Like I go to the College of Charleston and I'm a junior and I'm studying environmental studies. And this has to be one of the most diverse Zoom calls I've been on all semester. <laughs> like <laughs> I just like can't, like I'm like also seeing other brown people and I'm just like, I'm absolutely surprised. And it's frustrating because like as an environmentalist, like I feel like the social aspect just hasn't been at the forefront for so long. Um, and the importance of like getting black and brown people um, into this like environmentalist movement. So it's not like exclusionary at all. Um, mm -hmm. so I just want to say thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah. And that's why I think we've got to think of how do we bring those points of interest, right? Um, of people to converge and to connect with this environmentalism. Uh, and, you know, 
you know, I think particularly talking about environmental racism, definitely if people can begin to see those connections. I mean, just preparing for this, even kind of open by eyes, you know, it, it, it's like all of this stuff is so connected, you know. I, um, so this has been good. And it gets like frustrating a lot of the time because yeah. I'm in these groups and I want to bring like this racial aspect to the forefront and it's just, it's hard to start that conversation sometimes. Another one, another person in my group said like how like polarized everyone is right now. And it's just like, how do you, dismantle the polarizing, I don't know, you know. Right. Yeah. So I think we're gonna um, try in terms of really um, wrapping it up now, uh, given um, the time. And, um, we, you know, as we leave you and leave you to kind of continue uh, to consider and reimagine in terms of what the an eco future, your eco future would look like. We wanted to leave you with these um, images uh, done by Natalie Days and also, and so the epic words of her daughter, um, Sarah Days, Days uh, who's a Gullah woman, an Afro futurist writer, and a CFC grad. Mm -hmm. So Sarah says uh, in a recent piece that she did, she says, as a paradigm shift, and new ways of being are required. Let us remember we descend from folks who transmitted spiritual knowledge back and forth across continents and oceans. Folks who manifested freedom when everything else said otherwise. We came before the system and we're here now to imagine, manifest, and anchor in something new, something true, something epic. The salt is a portal and we're the proof. And I also want to just end with this one small piece by a Guyanese poet called Martin Carter. And he has a, a famous poet called Fragments of Memory, which tells us that from the beginning of time, the sea was always making misery because of how it was used by man. And he insinuates the corrupt use of the Atlantic by the capitalists. He said, we have a sea on the shore, whole waves of foam grown out perpetually, with ships coming in with the black slaves dying. On life, the ocean stained with memory. So I just wanted to leave you with those words and say thank you, thank you, thank you um, for being here and for us to be able to have this conversation. Yeah, thank you all. Thanks for your imaginations. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all for, for joining. Um, just a quick note, our next Climate Friday will be on October 23rd from one to two. Um, and we'll have Dr. Annette Watson uh, presenting on cross-cultural collaborations, bringing indigenous knowledge to bear on the climate crisis. And then next Friday, October 2nd, um, the Center for Sustainable Development will be handing over our social media to the Charleston Area Justice Ministry, CAJUM, um, and they'll be talking about some of their efforts around uh, climate change in the area. So again, thank you so much to our speakers. Thank you for those powerful images and those powerful words um, that you left us with today. And I hope everyone has a great weekend. Thank you for joining. <laughs>